All right, uh, can y'all see the uh, slides? Everyone that's not Alexis? Yeah. All right. So where did we leave off on last week? We were talking about, uh, yeah, I was still going through the uh, history of black women involved in women's politics. We stopped here back in the 70s talking about uh, Linda Taylor running away from the uh, welfare queen as well as talking about the uh, the impact the welfare rights organizations made. Uh, so as I stated before, Linda Taylor, uh, she was a criminal whose numerous uh, welfare fraud crimes as well as her appearance, her ambiguous, uh, she, she appeared to be ambiguous. Like she, she was very fair skinned and uh, had light brown hair and a very loose curl pattern that she could have passed for one of many different racial ethnicities, for, for racial groups or ethnic groups. I think I told you all that um, when Ronald Reagan was pro, uh, not protesting, campaigning for the presidency, everywhere that he went, he talked about Linda Taylor, but uh, changed up her racial identity. In the South, she was Black. In the Midwest, she was Black. Northeast, she was Latino. Uh, out west, she was Mexican, and uh, some of the more northern, the north, I guess, do we call the plain states areas like Montana, Nevada, Idaho, Iowa? She was Native American. Yeah. Uh, also, during this time, we see Black women uh, governing cities and states. The first Black woman ever to be elected mayor of a city was Ellen Walker Craig Jones, and that was back in 1972 for the city of Urban Crest. Uh, and then also during this time, yeah, towards as we move towards the 90s, we have the Clarence Thomas, uh, Anita Hill Senate hearing. So before the Brett Kavanaugh clusterfuck that existed, we had uh, Anita Hill uh, testifying about what Clarence Thomas allegedly did to her prior to uh, as climbing up the federal judicial ladder. And so since then, uh, so I do have two videos talking about talking about those two instances, and then we will finish. Yeah, finish up, but not finish up. Yeah, after that, uh, from 1995 through the present day, are we running the world? Are Black women running the political world? Eh, maybe. Who knows? Uh, da, 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 da. The biggest thing, let's see, the first thing under the new section, uh, we saw the end of welfare as we knew it, uh, changing the program from AFDC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children, to now uh, TANF, which stands for Temporary Aid for Needy Families. Uh, we'll talk about it in a couple slides later. But basically, the reason why AFDC ended and TANF was created was to decrease the likelihood of Linda Taylor type crimes ever happening again. Uh, if you place a strict time limit, a cap limit on the, the, the length of time you could stay on the welfare rolls, you can encourage uh, people, you can encourage self-initiative, you can encourage uh, better, uh, actually, yeah, there's all sorts of things that they talk about within the preamble of the, of the, preamble of the 1996 act that led to the creation of TANF that was like rooted in racism as well as misogyny. But a lot of uh, black elected, black elected officials and particularly black female elected uh, officials were was for the creation of TANF. But beyond that, you also have black women uh, choosing presidents and leading political parties. So let's see the first black woman, uh, yeah, Do Donna Brazil, uh, a leading DNC, uh, her interim, uh, her interim tenure as the DNC chairperson after Debbie Weisenhammer, you know, had to be kicked out for her shenanigans with the Clinton campaign. She became the first Black woman to oversee a political party. Uh, we also have, let's see, well, you know, Oprah's been was influential in the election of Obama. Uh, we also have. Higher ranking officials that are involved in the Republican Party. Well, I do know for the Ohio Republican Party, uh, there's a black woman that's the vice chairperson. I, I cannot recall her name right now, but her business card is on my desk 
at the Ogu office. So that I think that's ma that's major. But yeah, those are some of the uh, biggest accomplishments since the '90s. And so first, let's talk about the welfare queen. Da -da 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 -da. That's not the right song. All right, so we're back here. All right, we can all, is this the right one? Yeah, y'all can see the slides, right? Make sure this is right. Oh. No, it should be, yeah, that one. All right, y'all should be able to see that, cool. All right, so what about being the silent back of the racial group. So, of course, remember from the beginning of the semester, we talked about the average Black voter being a woman with at least a high school education, uh, owns a home, and is a Democrat. Uh, what else we found out since then? Uh, black women express higher levels of belief in linked fate. Recall that's the belief that your future. Uh, your future is connected to the future of the racial group as a whole. Uh, black women express higher levels of linked fate in comparison to black men, almost two to one. Uh, likewise, uh, despite these uh, strong connections, as well as expressed support for racial policies, black women's issues continue to receive little support in the larger struggle for black equality. Uh, likewise, in terms of black political ideologies, we also see the exclusion of black women's issues. Uh, let's see. So within the uh, classical phase of the civil rights movement, uh, the welfare rights organization helped organize women participants in marches in Atlanta, Memphis, and Chicago. Uh, the welfare rights organizations sent delegates to the March on Washington. However, civil rights movement leaders, particularly uh, Martin Luther King Jr., and A. Philip Randolph believed that the issues plaguing Black women, particularly those related to child care and racial discrimination in welfare rights, were secondary to the larger issues of public segregation and unequal access to the ballot. Uh, likewise, Black nationalist groups such as the UNIA, that is the, uh, that's Marcus Garvey's group, uh, the Nation of Islam, and most recently MOVE, promoted the embrace of traditional gender roles and contended that the issues plaguing Black women stemmed from their attempts to address issues that belong to Black men or from their uh, poor choice in men. So you are a single mother because you chose that no good trifling man. And as such, the problems that you're facing are of your own creation. So welfare as we know it. So in response to the devastating nature of the Great Depression, uh, FDR had created the National Welfare Program as part of his New Deal. Uh, and this program was called Aid to Dependent Children. Uh, under the New Deal, it was institution, uh, racial stratification was institutionalized. Uh, it was originally used, welfare was originally used as social control for poor immigrant families and as well as promoted the neglect of black women. Uh, local officials in particular treated welfare as a means of supervising and disciplining immigrant, immigrant recipients as well as, as, as much as a means of providing charity. Uh, they also felt that Black women didn't deserve assistance. Uh, likewise, we saw as time passed that uh, President Lyndon B. Johnson's failed war on poverty attempted to eliminate uh, racial barriers of public assistance programs in order to integrate Blacks into the national political economy. Uh, however, by the end of the 70s, the welfare queen, thanks to Linda Taylor's stereotype, uh, became synonymous with Black women and AFDC. Uh, so basically, the uh, there's a argument within social work that the cure for single, yeah, social work ideology, so if you ever decide you want to work as a social worker, uh, the cure for single mother's poverty laid in socializing foreign relief recipients to conform to American family standards. Uh, as a result, aid was generally conditioned on compliance with suitable home provisions, 
and often administered by juvenile court judges who specialized in punitive and rehabilitative judgments. Uh, black single mothers, on the other hand, were simply excluded. Uh, the first maternalist welfare legislation was intended for white mothers only. Administrators had either failed to establish programs in locations with large black populations or distributed benefits according to the standards that disqualified black mothers. And so as a result, in 1931, the, Nash, the first national survey of mothers' pensions broken down by race found that only 3% of recipients were black. Uh, the exclusivity of mothers' aids programs coincided with the entrenchment of formal segregation, uh, another progressive reform intended to strengthen social order. Uh, Northern New Dealers struck a bargain with Southern Democrats that systematically denied Blacks eligibility for social insurance programs. Uh, core programs allowed states to define eligibility standards and excluded agricultural workers and domestic servants in a deliberate effort to maintain Black, le uh, black menial labor caste in the South. So recall from the beginning of the semester that African Americans were essentially excluded from receiving for being qualified for and ultimately receiving social security because they uh, banned uh, workers from agriculture, so no farmers, as well as no domestic workers. And that, of course, that makes up the uh, majority of employment for blacks in the South. Uh, anyways, yeah, that uh, whites feared that social security would make both recipients and those freed from the burden of supporting dependents less willing to accept low wages. Likewise, the New Deal public works programs blatantly discriminated against Blacks, offering them the most menial jobs and sometimes paying them less than half of what white workers would have earned. Um, even aid to dependent children was created primarily for white mothers who were not expected to work. The relatively few Black recipients that did receive it received smaller stipends on the ground that Blacks needed less to live on than whites did. Uh, as AFDC became increasingly associated with Black mothers, already stereotyped as lazy, irresponsible, and overly fertile, it became increasingly burdened with behavior modification, work requirements, and reduced effective benefit levels. Uh, Social Security, on the other hand, effectively transferred income from Blacks to whites because Blacks have a lower life expectancy as well as pay a disproportionate share of taxes on earnings. Meanwhile, a white backlash had decimated the war on poverty programs within a decade. Hmm. So more about welfare as we know it. Uh, back in 1996, uh, Clinton and Congress passed, signed and passed the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act back in 1996. So it's the official title of the act is the 1996 Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act. Uh, and that is that legislation that turned AFDC into TANF. Uh, one of the features, yes, uh, let's see. One of the features of TANF is the stricter eligibility requirements, strict family caps, and shorter time periods. Uh, family caps in particular uh, prevented additional payments for children born while the mother is already on roll receiving benefits. Uh, Congress indicated that it's this welfare reform effort in particular that would address the problems plaguing the Black community. Uh, House Speaker Newt Gingrich attributed Black poverty and criminality to laziness. Uh, however, studies show that it's unclear if these family caps actually prevented the birth of additional children. Uh, the caps made women get stark differences in benefits. For example, a woman in New Jersey with one time at the with one child at the time of receipt and and then later gives birth gets $322, while a woman who applied with two children off the bat got $424. Uh, policies that discourage women on welfare uh, from having children are justified by a set of myths concerning family welfare, race, and poverty, all that assert that marriage is ultimately the true solution for uh, childhood poverty. And so we're gonna go through all the myths. Myth one, welfare induces childbirth. Yeah, it's not true. What's really going on is that the average number of kids in a welfare family is actually smaller than a family that's not receiving any benefits. Uh, poor women just don't become pregnant to receive benefits 
Instead, welfare lessens the financial burden poor women would be forced to bear in having an additional child, as well as reduces their incentive to take precautions against pregnancies. So the second myth, welfare causes dependency. And in particular, recall that conservatives, in particular black conservatives stance on public assistance. So we all know that conservatives claim that reliance on welfare causes social problems, such as promiscuity, crime, and laziness. Uh, mothers who receive welfare are thought to teach their kids a life of dependency by undermining their kids' motivation to support themselves. Even Clarence Thomas looked down on his sister for receiving welfare. Uh, she gets mad when the mailman is late for, with her welfare check. That's how dependent she was. What's worse now is that her kids feel entitled for the check too. They have no motivation for doing better or getting out of that situation. But in actuality, his sister worked two minimum wage jobs while he went to law school. She even stopped working to care for a sick elderly family member. By the time Clarence Thomas was appointed to the Supreme Court, his sister and her eldest child were gainfully employed. And so, yeah. And then finally, the uh, third myth, marriage can end racial, not end racial, marriage can end children's poverty. Da, 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 da. In actuality, there are racialized differences in childhood poverty. Uh, while white women are left impoverished by divorce, Black single mothers are more likely to be the generational victims of the dissolution of a two-parent household. While half of poor white mothers become poor, became poor at the time they established their single-parent household, 75% of poor Black mothers were already poor before they had any kids. Uh, black children living in two-parent households are still more likely to be poor than white children in single-parent households. And so it kind of sucks as a result of the coronavirus, but we would have gone into the racialized differences between household income and wealth if we didn't have the coronavirus, because that was, would have been the public policy section. We would have played the racialized monopoly and talked about uh, Shapiro and all, all the research that shows the differences in the, yeah, the racialized differences in income and wealth and what does that mean for like future generations. And so... That is the end of women's politics. And so now while I pull all the things together, we're gonna get into Black Lives Matter. Hooray, huzzah. I guess before I do that, does anyone have any questions? No? All right, so I will uh, go on and I don't know why is it doing all of that. Okay, let's see, so we... Play this while I pull it up. Don't you hate when all this stuff is going on? Let's see. So let's see, y'all all see the slides? What would it be better to do it this way? Yeah, share the slides. All right. Hooray, Black Lives Matter. Are the recent episodes of police brutality and race findings of, and the findings of race-based mass incarceration grounds for a new civil rights movement? Why or why not? That is due next Thursday. That is due on the 20th, yeah, on the 30th, seven days from now. Due April 30th, due April 30th. So, I do have some things to uh, use to set the stage, if it would just work for me one good time. Nope, 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 nope. Yeah, one and then three. All right, so setting the stage, got videos in particular, yeah, Black Lives Matter, as well as racial, discussion of racial fatigue syndrome. Because of course, talking about all this gets stressful after a while. Can you please play? We pause. Everything works so slow, y'all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right. We were reading. What were we reading? 
uh, Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow. We were also reading the assigned readings from, what's it called it? Now, I don't know. I don't think I assigned anything from Walton and Smith. We were also reading uh, chapters from Shayla Nunnally, uh, Distrust in America, and something else. Whatever's also in the syllabus. So let's get into talking about police brutality in particular. So what is police brutality? Definitions vary. Uh, there are definitions for police violence as well as then police brutality. I prefer using the definition of police brutality. It's just that it's any use of force exceeding that that's reasonably necessary to accomplish a lawful police purpose. Uh, there's no reliable measure of its incidence. So the way that you determine whether or not it's brutality is if it's doing too much, doing too much to get the job done. So let's say that, you know, you were pulled over by the police for speeding. And instead of, you know, asking for license and registration coming up nicely, they come with the gun drawn and telling you to get out the car, hands up, all of that. That is unreasonable force. Presuming that the uh, person that was pulled over did so in a polite and uh, responsive manner. So I do have charts, but uh, in particular, when we think about police brutality in New York City, we have stop and frisk. Uh, that's the NYPD practice in which police officers stop and question a pedestrian, then frisk them for weapons and other contraband. Uh, stop and frisk practices uh, disproportionately affected Black and Latino men, and uh, judges and experts had agreed that these stops are not based on reasonable suspicion of criminal activity. So stop and frisk is considered a type or a practice of police brutality. And so uh, local, state, and federal, federal government officials actually don't have reliable updated stats for the frequency of police brutality as well as their outcomes. Uh, back in 2002, the Justice Department found that there were over 26,000 complaints lodged in that year. Uh, this translates to about 33 complaints per police agency, as well as 6.6 .6 complaints per 100 full-time officers. Uh, back in 2013, the CDC, you know, that's the group that's trying to uh, tell us to stay in the, in the house and is working on that vaccine for the coronavirus so we can get out of the house, uh, they found that uh, the rate in which Black people are killed in Oklahoma by law enforcement is greater than anywhere else in the nation. However, Oklahoma, D.C., Nevada, and Oregon have the rate in which people are killed by police officers. Uh, states like, in states like Missouri, Black people are killed by law enforcement twice as frequently as white people. Uh, nationally, the rate in which Black people are killed by law enforcement is three times higher than that of whites. And so to really draw this point home, I do have graphs and charts because you know we are a data-driven people, or you should be a data-driven person. So nice infographic, neutral look at what police brutality is. So let's see, 43% uh, of police officers uh, agreed with the statement that always following the rules is not compatible with getting the job done. 25% uh, of officers stated that they witnessed fellow officers harassing a citizen, most likely because of that person's race. 52% uh, uh, said that it is not unusual for an officer to turn a blind eye to improper conduct by other officers. 49% said that the only way a criminal would receive any type of punishment was to punish that wrongdoer themselves. 61% uh, admitted that they do not always report serious criminal violations that involve the abuse of authority by fellow officers. 79% said they're not satisfied with the way the justice system deals with individuals they arrest. 67% reported that uh, officers who report incidents of misconduct are likely to receive the cold shoulder by their coworkers. 79% argued that reports in the news media have caused the public to distrust law enforcement. 84% have witnessed other officers use more force than necessary to make an arrest. And so in a given year, an average of 6.6 .6 officers will have a complaint filed against them for misconduct. 
uh, and to see the actual uh, occurrences on each level, it's almost 10% of city police, about 3% of sheriff's offices, about 3% for county police, and then about 1% of state polices. Polices, yeah. Uh, rapid growth of video-enabled smartphones is largely responsible for the increase in reports of police brutality as well as convictions of police brutality, with more than 60% now carrying video-enabled mobile devices. Uh, sexual harassment is also super uh, common. Uh, excessive force is the most reported type of misconduct, with sexual harassment taking second place. So brutality is like 19.4%. And then sex is almost 11%. And so also not all police forces are created equal. There are more than 10,000 complaints of police abuse uh, they, the, that were filed with the Chicago police between 2002 and 2004. However, only 19 resulted in meaningful disciplinary action. And so that is a discipline rate of, all, yeah, of almost 2% which is 40 times less than the national average. And so as I pull these slides back up again, now that you see these slides, what do you think? Are you surprised by these stats? What are we sharing? Did I share it back? Now we're here, share. Nobody's going to be on mute. Somebody, anybody, everybody. No one is surprised by the uh, stats about police brutality. And we're like, this is just business as usual. I feel like that's what we kind of like expected. I mean, I don't think like they overdid it, you know, like, I mean, stats are stats, but I feel like it wasn't anything too drastic, but it was like the amount that we feel like we see. So Lordina is like this, this just confirms what I already knew. Let's say the rest of y'all. Yay, man. Oh, well, moving on, oh, I just scratched myself. Moving onwards, talking about not trusting the man. Uh, when we were talking about black public opinion, we call the political reality model. That's just basically the perspective that attitudes are based on real political phenomenon. And so as a result, lower levels of trust amongst blacks are due to the fact that they have less political power than whites. Uh, so this leads to the whole concept of political distrust. Political distrust is just the name for the negative perception of politics held by citizens. This distrust is caused by the institutional treatment of scandals, as well as reports of corruption and discrimination. Uh, ideally, political distrust should decrease after the causes of said distrust are eliminated. However, the background of uh, long-term dissatisfaction can actually increase political distrust, even during, administra even during administrative changes. Uh, for racial minorities, especially for blacks, racial discrimination breaks down breaks down one's trust in the government. Uh, likewise, historical racial experiences promote distrust among citizens as well as distrust of their government. And so in the assigned reading, Trust in Black America, Race, Discrimination, and Politics, Shayla Nunnally expands the research concerning the political reality model. And so in the book, she goes on to explore the relationship between the formation of racial minorities, in particular Blacks, trust in government, as well as the presence of such trust on their lives. Uh, and so she goes into explaining how and why this trust, particularly for African Americans, exists in such a way. And she argued that it is just the result of the legacy of social, political, and economic oppression, and in such a way that the, the creation of institutional racism uh, encourages political distrust to be socialized also within the racial group. And so she goes on later in the book to describe the discriminative racial, racial psychological processing that explains basically the socialization into this political distrust for African-Americans. 
And so she describes that whole process, the discriminative racial psychological processing as the process through which Blacks internalize and externalize their racial attitudes in various contexts. Uh, let's see, Natalie contends that this theory affirms that race influences how Blacks trust levels are formed and as well as how they perceive their own racial groups in comparison to non-racial group members. Uh, she argues that Blacks internalize race through the development of their racial attitudes through learning different messages about race, as well as adopting racial stereotypes about groups, fearing perspective racial discrimination, experiencing race through their daily interactions with other racial groups, and ultimately trusting groups differently because of race. Uh, she also argues that Blacks externalize their, their attitudes towards racial groups in different contexts by trusting others differently based on the race of the actor in various contexts or by having more or less racialized trust. Uh, this varying level of racialized trust influences their level of trust in a given context. And so while I did not assign this whole book to you all, I do want to talk a little bit more about the findings. Uh, because this book, her book, Trust in America, came out three years before Black Lives Matter was a thing. Uh, and she was lauded by race scholars everywhere at the time. And so if you want more information, you know, I can tell you what aspects you should read. Anyways, uh, based on her discriminative racial psychological theory, she predicts that racial socialization messages emphasize negative intergroup relations as well as negative racial attitudes, would reduce Blacks social and political trust. And so by intergroup, I'm talking about between racial groups. So between Blacks and whites, between Blacks and Latinos, between Blacks and Asians. If we're talking about within the group itself, that's intra, I-N-T-R-A, intra group. Intergroup between two different groups, intra within one group. Anyways, in relation to other non-Black social and political actors, Blacks will be more trusting of their own racial group than towards the other groups. Uh, likewise, Blacks who were socialized negatively about their fellow group members and have negative attitudes about them will be less likely to trust them as well. Uh, in order to uh, test these various hypotheses, she used the data set, the 2000 Social Capital Benchmark Survey, as well as the 07 National Politics and Socialization Survey. Uh, she found that Blacks who received socialization messages about racial protectiveness increased their negative, their negative feelings and negative interactions with whites, Asians, and Latinos. Interestingly enough, Blacks have an ambivalent relationship with whites. They trust and distrust whites more than any other racial group. She also found that African Americans feel politically closer to Latinos than any other racial group. However, race, not race, however, age negatively influences this phenomenon. So basically saying that as you get older, you're less likely to trust the other group. In particular, in this case, as Blacks get older, they are less likely to trust Latinos. Uh, Nunnally ultimately concludes that race and racial discrimination experiences normalize expressions of Black political distrust within the group and expressions of Black, black political, and <clears throat> tongue is all messed up. Uh, where was I? Nunnally concludes that race and racial discrimination experiences normalizes expressions of Black political distrust within the group, as well as expressions of political distrust between Blacks and whites. Slavery by Another Name. It's a great book. Uh, gosh, it's written by da David Blackwell. Black, not Blackwell, Blackmon, B-L-A-C-K-M-O-N. If you ever take a, uh, F a Black history class that's focusing on, yeah, since slavery, so a Black history class that focuses on uh, freedom onward, that's a great book to read. That's why I named it this way. I read, I read it my freshman Black history class. Anyways, uh, convict lease system. So now we're changing uh, gears and going to start talking about not police brutality, but instead the incarceration system. Uh, so immediately after uh, the civil rights movement, no, immediately after the Civil War, you know, hooray, Blacks are freed, no more slavery. Uh, thanks to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, 
Blacks, in particular Black men during this time, were uh, get granted citizenship rights, access to the ballot, all of these great things, uh, with the goal, especially by the federal government, to incorporate them to the same levels and give them the same rights and privileges whites already enjoyed. Uh, however, within the South, there were uh, individuals who felt that African Americans still belonged in the fields and still belonged under the uh, power and rule of whites. Uh, and so as a result, the, uh, the what's to call it? A lot of states, uh, their criminal justice systems created a convict lease system and it was just so that they could force, as a result by the state, force African Americans to remain subservient to whites as a result of being in jail or as a result of being caught up in the criminal justice system. And so this convict leasing system is just the forced labor of imprisoned blacks uh, by Southern states, local governments, white farmers, and corporations between 1865 and 1942. These prisoners were usually caught up in jail because they violated local black codes. And so these black codes restricted black people's rights to own property, conduct business, buy and lease land, and move freely through public spaces. A central element of black codes were vagrancy laws. Uh, states criminalized men who were unemployed or who were not working at a job that whites recognized. Uh, failure to pay a certain tax or to comply with other laws could also be construed as vagrancy. And so as a result, the uh, convict leasing provided prisoner labor to private parties, such as plantation owners, corporations such as the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company, uh, while being leased, the uh, person, the prisoner was responsible, not the prisoner, uh, the company, the owner, etc. They were responsible for feeding, clothing, and housing the prisoners. Uh, corruption, lack of accountability, and racial violence resulted in the convict lease system becoming one of the harshest and most exploitive labor systems known in American history. And so, uh, let's see, blah, blah, blah. African Americans represented 33% of the population at the main prison in Nashville back in 1865. However, by 1867, it had increased to 58%. Uh, by 1869, it had increased to 64%. And it remained at an all-time high of 67% between 1877 and 1879. So just like just to think about exactly how what that looked like in particular, so in Nashville, in less than 10 years, it grew from 30 uh, black population being in jail grew from 33% to 67%. And that's just because in particular, Tennessee, the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company wanted that cheap labor. And the uh, frustrating part about it was that while the uh, company, the farmer, the plantation owner, et cetera, was responsible for feeding, clothing, and housing the prisoners, the, these entities would turn around and then bill the prisoner for providing such services. So it actually becomes really, it became really difficult for prisoners, especially black prisoners that were caught up during the, caught up in the convict lease system to actually leave jail. So when it was time, let's say you were sentenced for five years, uh, when it came time, and when, it, when it became the end of your term and you wanted to be freed, these entities would give you a bill and say, you owe us for feeding and clothing and housing you. But you're like, but I was a prisoner and I worked for you. It's like, no, 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 no. You, you also need to pay me for doing this. And so what would end up happening is if you were actually given a five-year sentence, it could actually take upwards of 10 years before you finally, you know, paid your debt to society as well as paid your debt to the businesses and to the entities as a whole uh, to really drive home, like, that, yeah, to drive home, like, how insidious it was. Though it was a uh, comedy film, uh, that film Life, starring uh, Eddie Murphy and Martin Lawrence, those two individuals in particular were arrested and caught up. That's how they ended up spending lifelong terms in jail. They were arrested on black for violating black codes and the vagrancy laws and could not leave in time. And so that's how they ended up spending essentially their lives in jail. And so this whole convict leasing system actually laid the groundwork 
in what we now call mass incarceration. And so all mass incarceration is, it just describes the phenomenon of comparatively and historically extreme rates of imprisonment uh, and by the concentration of imprisonment of young black men living in neighborhoods of concentrated disadvantage. And so how does this relate to uh, mass incarceration? Well, according to Michelle Alexander, the U.S. imprisons a large percentage of its Black population than South Africa did at the height of apartheid. Uh, back in 2010, the prison population uh, was at an overall rate for the prison population of Black men was at a rate seven times that of white males. Uh, the high rate of incarceration among Black men is part of an overall trend in punishment defined by dramatic increase in the carceral system. And all the carceral system is is just a term to characterize the legitimization and normalization of imprisonment as a factor of social life. In fact, there are more prisoners in the U.S. than there are in China. Uh, let's see. In fact, the U.S. is home to nearly a quarter of the world's prisoners, despite accounting for just 5% of the global population. So America is only 5% of the global population, but the prisoners represent 25% of the global prisoner system. Wild, right? And so later on in our book, Michelle Alexander explores this whole phenomenon. She finds that affected poor people, it, it, it affected poor people and that people of poor people and people of color in multiple ways. Uh, it deterred and incapacitated people it weakened poor families, keeping them socially marginalized. Uh, it is considered to be the fourth peculiar institution for the control of Black people uh, following slavery, Jim Crow, and the ghetto. Uh, she also describes rhetoric that describes mass incarceration as the result of the social, uh, as a result of the combination of cultural shifts, political realignments, changes in job prospects for low-skilled men. Uh, legal ch and legal changes that have driven the dramatic increase and absolute disparity in rates of imprisonment over the late 20th and 21st centuries. However, uh, yes, however problematic these mass incarcerations, the rate of crime has not decreased. Uh, more Africans are under correctional control today. And so I mean by that prison, jail, on probation or on parole then were enslaved in 1850 before the Civil War. So currently there are more people, more African-Americans under correctional control today than prior to slavery. And so why, why does this matter? Why should we care? We're all college students. I'm a professor. Odds are we won't. Not gonna get caught up by you know we're not gonna get pulled over by the police and get caught up will we well in particular we should be we should care about the situation primarily because of the school to prison pipeline as well as colorblind race uh, racism uh the privatization of prisons and yeah all of that stuff so i'll go through it so what do i mean by colorblind racism it's just the term for racial uh, for the discrimination of racial minorities as a result of or uh, of ignoring the institutional disadvantage of the non-white population. So it's like, no, I don't see race at all. I don't see skin color. Nope, nope, nope. It's just there are other reasons and other explanations that explain why there are disadvantages there. So it's like, eh, that person's caught up because they, you know they cho chose to make poor decisions, not looking at the fact that. Uh, racial discrimination has been institutionalized in the larger practice. And so that's what ultimately creates, it's still racism that creates the disparity between people of color and not people of color. And so ultimately colorblind ideology is the disregard of racial characteristics when selecting which individuals will participate in some activity or receive some service. In practice, colorblind operations use no racial data or profiling and make no classifications, categorizations, or distinctions based upon race uh, in efforts to promote equality. Uh, however, critics assert that colorblindness allows people to ignore the racial construction of whiteness and reinforces its privileged and oppressive position. In colorblind situations, whiteness uh, remains the normal standard, 
and blackness remains different or marginal. Essential tongue. Essentially, colorblind racism places negative emphasis on overly sensitive racial minorities attempting to call attention to perceived racial discrimination. Thanks to colorblind ideology, racial prejudice and discrimination has become the pink elephant in the room that no one wants to discuss. Instances of racial prejudice are now called microaggressions. Boom, boom, boom. So as a result of colorblind racism, you don't talk about Ra uh, racial prejudice instances as for what they are, you call them microaggressions. Moving onward to discuss the school to prison pipeline. This just refers to the policies and practices that push school children, especially poor black students out of the classrooms and into the juvenile and criminal justice systems. Uh, this pipeline reflects the prioritization of incarceration over education. Uh, characteristics include grossly underfunded and understaffed public schools. Uh, some private jails actually use third grade testing results. So you remember we were all in school and then depending upon what school system you were in, there was always like a standardized test at the end of the year. Uh, some private jails use those third grade results to estimate the prison population in the future. And unfortunately, for some of those uh, companies that did that, the results were actually accurate. Uh, they also do use zero tolerance policies that automatically impose se uh, severe punishment regardless of the circumstances. Uh, there's also increased reliance on police officers for school security. And so that leads to more school-based arrests. Uh, let's see. Uh, rather than teachers and administrators uh, maintaining discipline, grow, a growing number of districts employ school resource officers to patrol the hallways, oftentimes with little to no training for working with youth. And as a result, children are far more likely to be subject of school-based arrests, uh, the majority of which are for nonviolent offenses, such as disruptive behavior, than they were a generation ago. The rise in school-based arrests is the quickest route from the classroom to the jailhouse, most directly exemplifies the criminalization of school children. Uh, we also see uh, alternative schools with questionable educational practices that ensure suspended students will be left behind once they return to the main school. Uh, let's see. Uh, youth who become involved in the juvenile justice system are oftentimes what's it, oftentimes denied procedural protections of the courts. Uh, up to 80% of court-involved children don't have lawyers. Students who commit minor offenses may end up in secure detention if they uh, violate boilerplate, boiler, boilerplate probation conditions, prohibiting them from activities like missing school or disobeying teachers. And then finally, of course, the increased involvement of the courts and detention centers serve as the last stop before the adult prison system. And so moving onwards, students pushed along the pipeline, find themselves in juvenile detention facilities, many of which provide few or if any educational services. Uh, students of color who are far more likely to, uh, far more likely than their white peers to be suspended, expelled, or arrested for the same kind of conduct at school and those with disabilities are particularly likely to travel down the pipeline. Uh, though many students are propelled down the pipeline from school to jail, it is difficult for them to make the journey in reverse. Uh, students who enter the juvenile justice system may face uh, barriers to their re-entry into traditional schools. And so as a result, the majority of these students never graduate from high school. So let's talk about these private jails and prisons. So basically prisoners are incarcerated for privatization of jails and prisons within these, within the prison industrial complex, if you will, uh, prisoners are incarcerated by a third party that is contracted by a government agency. These private prison companies typically enter into these contractual agreements with governments that commit prisoners and then pay a per diem or monthly rate for each prisoner in the facility. Uh, it also refers to the takeover of existing public facilities, as well as the building and operation of new and additional prisons by for-profit companies. Uh, so it is actually lucrative to invest in these companies and arrest more people. 
uh, since 1980, for-profit companies are responsible for approximately 6% of state prisoners, 16% of federal prisoners, and inmates in local jails in Texas, Louisiana, and a handful of other states. Uh, notable investors in the private prison system include Wells Fargo, Bank of America, General Electric, uh, Columbia University, even though I think within the last two years, Columbia University promised to divest from the private prison system. Michael Jordan, the Gates Foundation, yeah, Bill and Melinda, yeah, they uh, invest in the private prison system. Uh, J.P. Morgan and Chase and Morgan Stanley. And so this right here, the private prison system, this is the reincarnated version of the convict leasing system. The convict leasing system walked so private prisons could fly. So let's talk about the racial disparities in crime classification and sentencing uh, as a result of laws such as the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986. Uh, it created sentencing disparities for different forms of the same drug, crack versus powder cocaine. So if you were caught with like a gram of crack, you could be looking at 10 years, while if you were caught with a gram of cocaine, you would get far less time, maybe five years or less. And the reasoning for that would be, well, that doesn't make sense. Crack is just a cheap derivative of cocaine. You'd think the one that has the more pure substance would be going to jail for longer. But nope, that was not the case. And so let's see, blah, 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 blah. And so uh, uh, this act is considered to be a racist law. Uh, the, in particular, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986 was considered to be a racist law because it discriminated against minorities who were more likely to use the cheap knockoff to use crack as opposed to powder cocaine. Uh, convicted in the federal court of possession, five, gram, five, five grams of crack would receive a, a minimum mandatory sentence of five years in federal prison. On the other hand, possession of 500 grams of powder cocaine would carry the same sentence. So five grams of crack and then 500 grams of cocaine each got you five years, which is outrageous. However, the Congressional Black Caucus, Caucus, the CBC, backed that law, which they say that, you know, which they implies that the law could not be racist. So if you ever want to uh, call out the CBC, you can, especially for their support of the 1986 Anti-Drug Abuse Act. Uh, let's see. We also see harsher long-term consequences for imprisoned poor people as well as African Americans and their corresponding uh, communities. We see housing loss, labor market, labor market exclusion, political disenfranchisement, as well as decreasing dating pools. So for how for uh, losing losing all of this. So for housing loss, uh, while waiting for trial, prisoners can be evicted. After, uh, can be evicted or after imprisonment be excluded from potential housing because of a criminal past. Uh, what do I mean by labor market exclusion? Uh, you can lose your job while waiting for trial. Uh, after you are freed, you can be excluded from many potential jobs due to your past. Uh, for political disenfranchisement, felons can't vote nor can they possess guns. And then for smaller dating pools, uh, for every 100 black women the of dating age between 25 and 54 who were not incarcerated, there are only 83 black men. And let's not even get into what where they are on the sexuality spectrum. Let's see, whatever, uh, what other things there are there? Well, uh, let's see. Okay, so, oh, I did have more about the Anti-Drug Abuse Act. Let's see. I know of, let's see, so my younger sibling's godmother is a recovering addict and she was freed, I want to say 10 years ago, uh, but she only had a, and yeah, a couple years ago, but she had to serve a 20 year sentence prior to being freed because she only, she was caught with a small dime bag of crack. Meanwhile, the person that she bought it from that also had large amounts of cocaine that person was not sentenced to as many years, even though they were the drug dealer. It was weird. So let's see. Uh, crime statistics show that back in 1999, Blacks were far more likely to be targeted by law enforcement for drug crimes and received much stiffer penalties 
and sentences than whites. Uh, back in 2013, it was determined that a black person is four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession than a white person, even though both rates have similar rates of marijuana use. Iowa has the highest racial disparity of the 50 states. Uh, black people in Iowa were arrested for marijuana possession at a rate of 8.4 times higher than white people. So frankly, I don't know, I didn't even know that there were black people in Iowa, which means like those 50 people, give or take, are in and out of the jails there. Uh, let's see, 1.4 million African-American men as a result of being in prison or as a result of being felons were unable or ineligible to vote back in the 2008 election. And so in talking about smaller dating pools and all that stuff, one in six black men have simply disappeared from daily life because of incarceration and early death. And so this leaves devastated communities, impoverished families, and creates a cycle of stigma, shame, and hopelessness. And so I think it's actually a good part to stop here because there's a discussion question. And so we can always open up with that discussion question. So that means on our last day next Tuesday, we'll finish up Black Lives Matter and I'll talk about the final exam which will not be hard. Of course, it'll go live next Thursday and you'll have from Thursday to Saturday, similar to the midterm, to take it. Does anyone have any questions or anything? Um, are you gonna give us a study guide for that one? Uh, there should be, we'll go with yes. Okay, I, I have to look you. for it, like it, it exists. I know it does. Any other questions? We're almost to the end. We're so close to summer vacation. Whatever Can that we, looks like. Like go over the study guide. Like, do we have any questions or whatever? Like, are we gonna have like a review session? Yeah, we're gonna have a review session. Yeah. So that's what I'll do immediately after class. Look for the what's it call it? Look for the study guide. And if not, go on and make it and put it up there. But I'm almost certain that it exists. I just gotta look for it, that's all. Any other questions? No? Well, enjoy the rest of y'all day and I'll be putting these videos up on YouTube shortly. All right. <sighs>